Hi, and welcome to our first lecture in Math 2LA3. In this lecture, we'll talk about vectors, which are the primary object of study in linear algebra. In this course will be mostly concerned with uh, vectors in Rn. Okay. So a vector in Rn is an ordered list of n many real numbers. Okay, so there's two main ways we can write this down. Okay, so let's say that v is our vector in Rn. Okay, so the symbol here in the middle means that v is a member of the vector space Rn. We can write it as an ordered list of numbers. Okay, so that's the first way of writing it. We write v, and then we write its components. So v1 is the first real number, v2 is the second real number, and so on up to vn. Okay, that's the first way of writing it. The second way, and really the more useful and common way to write it, is by writing it as a column vector like this. Okay, so we'll be dealing with a lot of matrix equations and vector equations in this course. Okay, so an example of a, a matrix equation is ax, sorry, a times v equals b. Okay, so if we know that a is a matrix and v is a vector in Rn, Okay, so V is an ordered list of n many real numbers. To, to compute this matrix equation, we have to decide, is V going to be a column vector like this? Or is V going to be a row vector like this? Okay, and the default choice is that we interpret V as a column vector like this. So whenever you see uh, a vector in an equation, you always interpret the vectors as column vectors, vertical, like this. Okay, so these are the two ways we can write uh, a vector. Sometimes in matrix equations like this, we really do want a row vector, though. We want it to be uh, horizontal like this. Okay. That's okay. We just have to specify V transpose, and then we'll get a row vector version of V. Okay, so that's the notation. So let's define the basic uh, addition and scalar multiplication operations on vectors in Rn. Okay, so start with vector addition. If we have two vectors in Rn, we add them component-wise. Okay, so let's call the two vectors u and v. Okay, the sum u and v, sorry, u plus v, uh, is going to be the first entry will be u1 plus v1, the second entry will be u2 plus v2, and so on down to un plus vn. Okay, so it's what you expect from addition. Okay. And I uh, guess we should note that it doesn't matter which order you add the vectors, right? U plus V is the same as V plus U. Okay. So in other courses, uh, you, you may have seen vector addition uh, you know, defined in some weird way that still meets the criteria for uh, addition in a vector space. In this course, we'll just use the standard vector addition. Okay, so addition will always be this for our course. So, scalar multiplication of vectors. Okay, so Suppose you have a vector, 
v and you multiply it by a scalar constant c so c is just some real number okay so how does that work well you just multiply each component of v times c okay so this is sometimes called uh, scaling the vector v by c okay and we'll note here how uh, addition and scalar multiplication interact they interact as you want them to um, the it has this nice distributive property like this okay Let's talk about the dot product on two vectors. Okay, so here's the definition of the dot product. Okay. So if we let v and u be vectors in Rn, then the dot product of v and u is written v dot u. Okay, and this is the formula for it. Okay, so what is it? So you take the product of the first components of V and U plus the product of the second components of V and U and so on, all the way up to the products of the nth components and you sum them all up. Okay, so that's the dot product. You've probably seen this in uh, many other courses. So let's go over some properties of the dot product. Okay. So uh, property one says that u dot v is equal to v dot u. Okay. So that's sort of obvious from uh, the formulation here. Okay. Since it doesn't matter which order you multiply two real numbers, this expression is exactly the same as u dot v. Okay. Now let's look at the second property here. We'll uh, assume that, uh, again, that u and v are vectors and c is some scalar multiple. Okay. So this property says that if I compute the dot product between u and v and then multiply that number by a scalar c, that's equal to scaling u by c and then taking the dot product with v or scaling u sorry scaling v by c and then taking the dot product with u okay and this again follows pretty straightforwardly from the formulation here okay so if you're scaling v by u sorry if you're scaling v by c then there's going to be a C attached to each one of these. If you're scaling U by C, there's going to be a C attached to each one of these. If you take the dot product and then multiply by C, there's just going to be a C attached to each one of these. And again, since for real numbers, it doesn't matter which order you multiply them in, all these are the same. Okay. The third property shows how uh, the dot product and addition interact. Okay? So if u, v, and w are all vectors, then the dot product distributes over addition in the same way um, multiplication distributes over addition in the real numbers. So this is a familiar property. Okay, so Whenever you have a function, it's nice to um, determine what the inputs and outputs of the function are. So what does the dot product do? Okay. It takes in two vectors in Rn. Okay. That's what you have to put into the dot product. And the output is one real number. Okay. So whenever we have uh, matrix equations, it's important to 
like identify what the objects are okay and so when you see um, a vector dot another vector immediately you should think that's a number right it's not a vector anymore that is a number now okay so let's make the observation that if we have the zero vector and we take the dot product with any other vector in Rn, the result is zero. Okay, so what's the zero vector? It's just a vector with the number zero in every entry. Okay, and it's pretty obvious that no matter what uh, v is, right, if you're dotting the zero vector, then this whole thing is just zero. So it's worth noting in this equation I've written here that on the left-hand side, uh, this is the zero vector. And on the right-hand side, this is the number zero. Okay? So um, um, I'm distinguishing them by uh, writing a little arrow above zero here. Okay? Like I said, it's always good to identify uh, what sort of objects are uh, in your equations. Okay. And the final note here is that the dot product can be written as a product of matrices. Okay. So we haven't gotten into matrix multiplication yet, but um, we should note that if we're taking v dot u, it's the same thing as v transpose times u, where times means matrix multiplication. Okay? And um, It'll be useful useful for us in the future to uh, identify that uh, these two things are the same, and be able to go back and forth between these two things. Okay. Now that we've defined the dot product, we can now talk about the length of a vector. Okay, so the length or the norm of a vector v in Rn is written like this. Okay? So we write v with uh, two bars on either side. So it's like the absolute value, but two bars instead of one. And it's defined like this. Okay? We take the dot product of v with itself and then take the square root of that. Okay, so remember the dot product is a number, and so we're taking the root of a number. Okay, so let's uh, expand out this formula. Okay, so what does it look like when you take the dot product of a vector with itself? Okay, so we think about it, you'll end up taking the square of each of its components and then summing them. Okay, so first component squared plus second component squared and, and so on. Okay, so this is equivalent to v dot v under the root sign here. Okay, so this formula is sort of a, a higher dimensional version of the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so it works in all dimensions. Okay. Okay, so that's the definition for the length or the norm of a vector. Okay, it's also called um, the Euclidean length or the Euclidean norm. Okay, so let's uh, make some notes about this norm. Okay, so the first note here is that the norm, or the length, 
is greater or equal to zero. In other words, it's non-negative. Okay, so why is that? Well, look at the form here. Okay, you're taking the squares of numbers. So the square of a number is never negative, even if the number is negative itself, right? So this is non-negative. This is non-negative. It's the sum of a bunch of non-negative numbers. And then if you take the root of a non-negative number, get another non-negative number. Okay, so the length of a vector is always uh, greater than or equal to zero. And that matches up with our intuitive sense of what length should be, right? The length shouldn't be negative, right? What does that mean? Okay. Second property here is that um, if we multiply or if we scale V by a constant C and then take the norm, that's the same as taking the norm of V and then multiplying by the absolute value of C. Okay, so C is some real number. Okay, and that falls out from um, this equation here. Okay, so uh, remember, if you have C times V, then if you compute the, the norm of C times V, you'll have a CV squared here. And then you can factor out a C squared from all of these. And then you can factor out uh, c squared rooted out of the whole thing, okay? And so c will lose its sign if it has it. That's why it's the absolute value here, okay? So this is a, an, an exercise you can do. Okay, let's also note that if the length of the vector is zero, that means the vector has to be the zero vector, right? That's the only way it'll work, okay? It's straightforward from this formulation here. Okay, so let's say, what are the inputs and outputs of the vector length, okay? So the input is one vector in Rn, right? We put in one V, and output is a number, okay? One real number. And we also know that this real number is going to be greater than or equal to zero, okay? So whenever you see the length of a vector in a vector equation, that's a number, okay? Finally, we'll say this bit of vocabulary here. So a vector, we say, has unit length or is called a unit vector if its length is one, okay? So we give these vectors a special name because vectors with this property, they're of unit length, have um, very nice computational properties and we'll be seeing a lot of unit vectors. Now we can talk about orthogonality for vectors, okay? So here's the definition of orthogonal for two vectors. Okay. So for two vectors in Rn, they're orthogonal if the dot product between them is zero. Okay, so that's a straightforward definition. We can also talk about orthogonality for uh, sets of vectors bigger than two, okay? So let's assume we have uh, a set of vectors, q many of them, okay? So that's, this is the set notation I'm using here, okay? So the, the curly brackets means I'm defining a set of vectors here, okay? And we'll assume there's q many of them. So this set of vectors is orthogonal 
if every pair of vectors in the set is orthogonal. Okay, so every pair part here is important. Okay, so you need to take the dot product between every um, two distinct vectors in this set. Okay, and when Q is large, that's actually a lot of uh, a lot of computations you have to do. Okay, so a uh, set of vectors is either orthogonal or not. Okay, so it's orthogonal if every single pair um, of vectors is orthogonal. That is, they have dot product zero, and it's not orthogonal if there's just one pair that has dot product non-zero. Okay. Now I'll, I'll make this note here that every vector is orthogonal to the zero vector in Rn. Okay. And that just comes from our previous fact here that every vector has uh, dot product zero with the zero vector. So now I'll mention uh, the geometry of orthogonality a bit. Okay, so in Rn, if we have a set of uh, non-zero vectors, being orthogonal corresponds to the vectors being perpendicular. Okay, so if you recall, being perpendicular means that the angle between the vectors is 90 degrees, or it's a right angle, or it's a pi over 2 radians. Okay, so that's what perpendicularity means. Okay, so let's look at uh, an example here. So I'm going to define a set of vectors in R2. So the vector 1, 1, and the vector 1, negative 1, and I can ask, is this set orthogonal or not? Okay, so how do you check? Well, you just apply the definition, right? I take the dot product between these two vectors, and I see that the dot product is indeed zero. So we conclude that these vectors are orthogonal, and S is a set of orthogonal vectors. Okay, since there's only two vectors here, it's it's just one calculation, right? And if we graph these vectors, okay, we th we see that yeah they make a a ninety degree angle here, so they're perpendicular. Okay, so now we'll look at another definition. So. This is sort of uh, an expanded version of orthogonality. Okay, so a set of vectors. Okay, so v1 through vq is called orthonormal if every pair of vectors in the th in the set is orthogonal. Okay, and every vector is unit length. That is. The length of each of these vectors is one. Okay, so orthonormal is orthogonal, but with uh, an extra condition. So it's a, a stronger condition, right? You need that every vector is unit length. Okay, so let's look at our example above and ask: Is it orthonormal? Okay. So we know, we already know it's orthogonal, right? So it meets the first condition. Now we have to check the length of each vector. Okay, so if we just check the length of both vectors, we'll see that neither of them have length one. Okay, if you just use the formula for length um, on the previous slide, we'll see that each of these vectors has length two. Okay? So S is an example of a set that's orthogonal, 
but it's not orthonormal. Okay, so let's think about this example a little more. So we determined that this set S is orthogonal, but not orthonormal. Okay, because essentially the vectors were are too long. They're not of length one. Okay, so let me make this observation here. Okay, so this vector one one. Let's say I scaled it by a factor of five. Okay, so I multiply one one by the constant phi. Okay, so I'd get a vector that would be much longer. It'd be like this. It would be the coordinates would be five five. Okay, but it would be in the same direction. Okay, that means it has the same angle with one negative one. Okay, that means it's still orthogonal to one negative one. Okay, so it seems like if I have a vector and it's orthogonal to a vector, another vector, scaling it won't change the orthogonality. Okay, so then I can ask, you know, I, I made it bigger, right? I made it, I multiplied it by five. Can I multiply it by something so that it is of length one? And then if I do that, then I'll have an orthonormal set, right? Okay, so the answer is yes, you can do that. And it's called uh, normalizing the vectors. Okay, so, so I said that scaling doesn't affect orthogonality. And that's justified by this property of the dot product. Okay, so assume that u and v are orthogonal. Okay, and so u dot v is zero. So, if I scale u by some uh, number, say 5, okay, the, the dot product between 5u and v is still going to be 0, right? Because this is equal to this, and u dot v is 0, so the, the dot product between the new cu and v will also be zero. Okay, so that that justifies the statement that um, if two vectors are orthogonal, scaling either one of them or scaling both of them, they'll still the new vectors will still be orthogonal. Okay, so here's the statement. Um, so if v1 through vq is an orthogonal set of vectors then this set where it's c1 times v1 c2 times v2 all the way up to cq times vq where each of these c's is some scaling factor some number this new set will also be orthogonal okay so that's a good observation okay so our goal or our question was how do we turn this s into an orthonormal set we want we want to preserve the directions of these vectors but we want to force them to be of length one instead of length root two so that process is called normalizing the vector for the vectors so you can normalize a non-zero vector v by doing this, multiplying it by the number one over the length of v. Okay, so take v, normalize it, multiply it by one over the length of v. Okay, so this new vector will be a unit vector with the same direction as v. Okay. 
Okay, so let's analyze this expression here. So remember, uh, the length of v is a number. So 1 over the length of v is a number. So this is a number, a scalar, times v. Okay, so it's an exercise that you can, that might be insightful to check that no matter what v is, if I take the length of this vector here, you'll always get 1. Okay, that, that's a good practice problem. Okay. Okay, and since we're just scaling it by uh, a number, it will be in the same direction as v. Okay, so what can we do? We can transform the set S into a set of orthonormal vectors by normalizing each vector. Okay, so let's normalize 1, 1. Okay, so I take 1, 1 and I multiply it by 1 over the length of this vector 1, 1. Okay, remember we said the length with root 2. Okay, and then to, to compute this, we just expand the constant into the vector. And so 1 over root 2, comma, 1 over root 2 is the normalized version of 1, 1. Okay, similarly for 1, negative 1, the normalized version will be 1 over root 2, comma, negative 1 over root 2. Okay, and you can double check that these are, both of these are indeed of length 1. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at what these new vectors look like. Okay, so uh, the blue, the vectors in blue are our new normalized vectors. Okay, they have both have length 1. You see they're both uh, still in the direction of the original vectors that they came from, right? And they're both still orthogonal. Okay, so we're going to call this new set S prime, um, and it's an orthonormal set of vectors. Okay, and we don't even need to recheck that these vectors are, are orthogonal by taking the dot product, right? Because all we did was scale these vectors, right? And scaling them won't spoil orthogonality. Okay, so I guess the, the sort of lesson here is that uh, if S is an orthonorm, sorry, an orthogonal set of vectors in Rn that doesn't include the zero vector, then S can be transformed into an orthonormal set of vectors by this normalization property. Okay, so so in this statement we have to exclude the the zero vector, right? We can't allow that to be part of S because you, you can't force that to be uh, of length one, right? Uh, if it's zero, then no constant is going to stretch it to be of non-zero length, right? So we have to exclude zero from this uh, statement. Okay.